Ramsar site is a um, uh, wetland that's been um, declared of international importance. It's uh, a Ram the Ramsar Convention is for protection of wetlands, and it's an international agreement Australia signed on to. So it's a it's a legal, legal obligation Australia has to manage these Ramsar sites. And they devolve that responsibility through to Victoria um, and the land managers of those wetland areas in Victoria. So, so it's a, considered a multi-jurisdictional type management arrangement. Um, and so a lot of the Glenelg Estuary Discovery Bay Ramsar site um, and its management is through a number of different agencies. Uh, Probably more recently in the Ramsar space, catchment management authorities got involved and we're the new, new kid on the block, so to speak. Um, we've been, uh, our, our responsibilities in Ramsar man management has, has been written into our waterway strategy, which is our guiding document for waterway and wetland management. However, um, with Ramsar sites, we're a, what's called a, a site coordinator and so, we don't own any land in Victoria as CMAs, but what we do try and do is, is work with the range of partners in collaborative arrangements, work on um, you know, goodwill, working with landholders and land managers who own those lands or who are responsible for managing legislation that protects the, the things and values of those lands. So in that way, we coordinate. We work with the land manager, and in this case, the land manager is still Parks Victoria. Um, as they manage Lower Glenelg National Park and Discovery Bay Coastal Park. And I really want to stress to you this, this Ramsar um, management plan that we have to guide us in how we manage the values here is, is a subset of a range of, of other strategies being adopted by Parks Victoria and by DELP, uh, the, land, the landowner on behalf of the Crown, to look after these areas, okay? Um, so, the Ramsar Site Management Plan really talks, really drills into the ecological values that are really important from a wetland perspective. It doesn't include a lot of the terrestrial aspects that are, that are important here, um, but in, in designing our, our site boundary and our Ramsar site, we included park boundaries for ease of management, ease of putting a line on a map, uh, but really our management strategies are aimed at those aquatic and wetland dependent sort of values that are found here. With regards to the site, the management of the site, um, there's, a, there's a governance arrangement in place where it's um, an agreement across the state in terms of the land managers, the landowners and the site coordinators of how, of how that arrangement should work. And the reason we have this new arrangement in place is because a, at the time the Rams, this Ramsar site was being listed, there was a Victorian Auditor General's review of Ramsar site management across the state. And it didn't come up very well. Like Ramsar sites weren't being managed very well. Um, Glen Elg Estuary Discovery Bay is the new kid on the block, so we were lucky. We just, we just started with the new, new arrangements in place. But a lot of other Ramsar sites across the state have had to adapt their existing arrangements to get, to get them up to speed with what was expected. And what is expected is a, um, a regular communication between the land manager, the landowner, the coordinator, and any other relevant authorities involved and engagement through back into the community um, and to receive feedback from the community. So that's the mechanism that those coordination groups are all operating across the state. At this particular site, um, that includes Parks Victoria, um, the land manager, DELP, Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning, the land owner on behalf of the Crown, and it includes the Glen Hill Hopkins Catchment Management Authority. And, and we take on a role of coordination. So that's communication, that's project management, that's keeping everyone doing their bits and pieces um, of, of an agreed range of strategies. Our other agencies involved include Southern Rural Water, who are charged across the state with managing water allocations, primarily ground groundwater in, in this, this part of the world. Um, and um, Glenelg Shire Council are involved in the um, uh, Royal Ramsar Coordinating Committee as well from a, from a perspective of keeping a, a staff member engaged in the process. Uh, as I mentioned, Goodage Mearing, traditional owner, Aboriginal corporation uh, on our coordination committee and their involvement is one of shared, shared management of the land um, from a, a southwest um, national parks and, coast and reserves area 
Greenwich Mirroring and Parks Victoria work hand in hand together in terms of park management. So importantly for this Ramsar site, that's, that's how it's working as well. So they sit on the Ramsar Coordinating Committee. Also on the Coordinating Committee, we have just recently uh, uh, got a representative from Victorian Fisheries Authority, which is, um, has been a while in the making, like we've been 18 months or so going as a Ramsar Coordinating Committee and just recently getting a, a, a VFA rep on that group has been good for us. Um, not sure if you're aware, there's a commercial um, pivy fishy, fishery off the coast of Discovery Bay and, and the lion's share of that commercial harvest is taken out of Discovery Bay and managed through Fisheries Victoria. That has an impact on some of the way the park is managed and access to the park, so it's important to keep them in the, in the space as well. So that's, that's sort of the arrangement. And then we come to this forum today, is our, I guess our attempt to present back to you and get a range of speakers to present back to you on what it is the Ramsar site management strategies are doing, what are the actions we're taking on the ground to address the strategies we wrote into our management plan uh, to protect the values we said were important for Ramsar site. So that's the hi hierarchy, if you like. And um, Im importantly, for me is, is how I communicate that information to you. And I'm open to lots of suggestions on that. Um, I need to make it efficient as possible because we're not resourced to do this full time. It's a part-time part role, but I still want to make it um, as transparent as possible at the work we're doing, why we're doing it that way, and also to receive the feedback so we can improve on the management as we go, go forward, if, you know, if, there's, if there's valid feedbacks. And to get those tie-ins where we need to, um, in terms of local projects that might be going on, like for example, how can we get uh, the citizens or the people walking the Great South West Wall, feeding some information about sightings through to us, and, um, and how do we get that collaborative community feel about the space around Ramsar and that, that beautiful part of our world. Probably the lion's share of the work we've been doing in the last 12 to 18 months is around monitoring and commencing a few projects, um, manage, management style projects. Some of those are works and on-ground works in terms of constructions, and some of them are about um, some of them are about destruction in terms of destroying woody weeds and the like, which Nick will talk about shortly. And some of them are about investigations, filling some of the knowledge gaps. We didn't quite have enough knowledge around particular things that we listed in the site. There was enough evidence to, to list them, but we needed a bit more to find out how to manage them better. One of our action items was to implement an engagement strategy for Ramsar site values. So engagement meaning, let's, let's get out and talk about the values, get some feedback, get some, you know, some uh, conversation going around, what are those values? So we engaged Joe Kirkpatrick here today uh, to design a, an engagement strategy. And so that's, that's in press at the moment, or I guess 90%, 95% 90 complete. That includes a range of collateral products, information brochures, fact sheets, a uh, map, map product like this that shows the values of the site in a map context. Um, not necessarily where they are, but where, where you might go and think, you know, that's the habitat they sort of hang out in and, and, uh, and go and look for them. Um, it included a, a benchmarking exercise um, and we took, we took a street survey approach, street surveyed Portland residents, um, out, on, out on the street doing their shopping at Mount Gambia and in Nelson, Australia Day long weekend, I think, this year. And that set the scene. We asked them a range of questions. What do you think about Ramsar sites? Do you know anything about it? Um, what do you think, who's managing the place? Do you know anything about them? Um, what do you think the values are of the site? What do you know about them? Um, and we got a range of responses. And by, by and large, most people didn't didn't, knew that it was a Ramsar site, so that's a good thing, um, but probably didn't know how the site was being managed or um, necessarily what the, the level of value, what the values were in the listing. They knew the place was spectacular and beautiful and they used it, which is what you would expect. Um, so that's, that's a basis, a baseline for us to then go back in the future and reassess after we've done some engagement work in terms of getting information products out communicating, running workshops such as this. So this map product, just if for your interest, uh, it's, it's on the Avenza map store. You can download it on your phone and then you can find a little blue dot if your GPS signal is working and you can find out where these features are across the Ramsar site. So my, my interest in this was um, driving, driving this Portland Nelson Road. There's very few opportunities to see you know, the, June, the big June fields here or to see Long Swamp or Monibiong. But 
if you're driving along that road, you've got this device or your co-navigator's got this device, um, you might have a chance of sharing some of the insights of what's in the landscape just over the, over the pine trees. Like so that's, that's the reason for it. Um, when you're out there, you can actually ping things, take photos, and it puts it on a map so you can refer to it again another time if, if you want to. Uh, a couple of fact sheets have been developed. Um, one is a facts and figures, and one's a, a brochure, if you like, more a descriptive brochure. They're available on the back table. Please take a copy with you if you like. And we've just recent, and they've been distributed to all the information centres in the region, from Hayward, Mount Gambier, through to Warrnambool, I believe. Uh, we actually got some into Janjuk as well, near, near Torquay. So, um, hopefully that's going to extend a few of the visitors from the Great Ocean Road out this way to have a look. Uh, and there's also another fold out, you know, A3, but folded down to DL size um, brochure with the, that map inside and a, lot, a little bit more information as well. There's a couple of banners, as you can see, have been produced to roll out at workshops and some signage. So there's some signs going in, um, uh, in consultation with Parks Victoria and Nelson Coast Care with the, um, the existing park sign here in town. So um, the sign that the signage that's going up is probably going to look a bit similar to that. It'll be a map-based sign, some photos on it, um, and some descriptive words off the side, but still a work in progress. Similar to the, uh, um, the Great Southwest Walk, how they had their four, you know, their four landscapes they walk through. The Glen Elg Estuary Discovery Bay Ramsar site has, has three um, management units. They're the freshwater wetlands, the Glen Elg Estuary, and the beach and dune field systems. There's a set of values within each of those. So the estuary is, is known for its, you know, its limestone gorge, longest estuary in Victoria. It's pretty unique in terms of the southeast drainage division. There's um, uh, diadromous fish species that um, use the fresh and saltwater parts of that estuary and the river system for part of the life cycle. And heritage listed river as well. So some of those key values of what it's um, already known for what make it a, a, good, a good Ramsar value site. There's the beach and dune fields. So the beach system, the Discovery Bay beach, which Victorian part is in the Ramsar site, but Discovery Bay, as we all know, includes, extends over into South Australia, um, is a very, very much a, um, a home, a, a shorebird uh, habitat site for migratory shorebirds. Uh, Sanderling in particular is a listed value. And that bird's, you know, making journey twice a year to Siberian Arctic sort of circle areas and back to Australia to s over summer down here. Um, a part of that population overwinters here each year. So there's, there's, a, there's that youth, youth value that's still staying here. We've got to look after them while they're here. Um, and the, the context you'll hear Dan talk about is these birds are at home when they're here. They go away for a tourist season and they come home here. So that's what we need to look after. We need to look after their habitat and their, their feeding, feeding grounds while they are here, okay? And give them in the best condition so they can make the journey home. Resi local residents, and there's a number of other species that also make that similar journey. New Zealand are over here as well. Red knots have been seen here recently. There's a number of other more domestic species. Um, uh, the hooded plovers, as you all know, the cute little hooded plovers that finds its life on the beach, um, is, is that species we found here and it's listed value for this site as well. There's a couple of little cryptic orchids um, down in the freshwater wetland unit um, and, and as well as some of the fish species that are found in those systems and the diversity of vegetation and wetland types in that freshwater area. So they're the, they're the values that we're listing for the site, okay? And that's what makes it great for us here. Uh, growling grass frog as well and down here in the Baumey of Sedgelands is the ancient greenling, a little uh, damselfly that's it's found its way up onto an international union of conservation, um, IUCN list, uh, red list for threatened species. And importantly, uh, Dave, David Pitts, who you might know as local park ranger, will be coming here tomorrow to have a chat. Um, he, is, uh, he, was, he was the, made the discovery and got the researchers here to, to confirm and do population counts and that sort of thing. So just through having a local ecologist stomping around through the wetlands was a good, good thing for us. This little critter you may not see, uh, Australasian, Australasian bittern. Uh, you might hear it, flush it out of it if you're walking around a wetland somewhere. Um, if you do, it's a great observation because we haven't seen them necessarily a lot for a while, but they are making their way back slowly. There's a lot of work going on in the monitoring space. Because we can't be out here all the time, we're using audio recorders, um, technical equipment to to record the calls of frogs. And then through the calls, we can then analyse the, the 
for the audio and work out what frog was there. Similarly, with the Australasian bittern, we can detect its calls when it's, when it's in its mating range or when it's um, um, getting flushed out for whatever reason. Okay? Uh, orchids, unfortunately, we still have to go and search for them and, and uh, monitor their populations and also do further searches for um, unknown populations yet, but we know that are still there somewhere. And same with the greenling. Estuary management hasn't changed. Jared Obst, who you all know, is the um, estuary officer for the Glen Hopkins CMA, still um, keeping an eye on estuary water levels, water quality, keeping track of flows and inflows and, and uh, estuary, condition, estuary mouth conditions so that we don't interfere with that natural process. And that natural process is doing its own thing, you know. If the river's open, it's open. If it's closed, it's closed. We don't want to see it too far either way, an extreme. It's just doing its, its own thing. The more we can support it to go naturally, the better. Uh, importantly on the audit though, 2016, the Victorian Auditor General reviewed Ramsar site management in Victoria. Currently there's a parliamentary inquiry going on to say, Victorian government, how did you go? How did you go implementing what you said you would do when you said you would do it? We can comment, but only through our ministerial channels, not, not publicly at all. So the take home message for this group is that um, the site management and the coordination of the group, the Ramsar Coordination Committee of how we're doing things here is being used as a case study, if you like, to put into that response to the parliamentary inquiry. Um, and it's about how much money have you spent in Ramsar site management? Have you done exactly what you said you'd do? Um, or is everyone doing their roles? And I think um, over, over time, we'll get a better handle on how well we're coordinating amongst our agency groups, but also how well we're going engagement wise with the communities. Um, we're not there yet, don't, don't get me wrong, um, but I think we can improve on the space, but that's also part of what that parliamentary inquiry is looking at. Traditional owner connection, um, Goodnage Mirroring have a representative on our committee, as I said, and they're constantly helping us make good decisions about where to protect the sites of significance for them. Shell middens, um, burial sites that are known in that landscape, in that sand dune and river country. Um, and it's about working with them to ensure that we don't interfere with those, those processes, whatever's happening there. As I mentioned, there's a lot of, has been working in the coordination and monitoring space. Ramsar Coordinating Committee keeping that functioning, some communication and engage, engagement work, um, and setting the scene for how we're going to do that. Monitoring the values, as we said, and this thing called monitoring effectiveness of management um, actions. That is, that is us trying to have a go at, not just monitoring you know, the bird species that are coming to visit and the, the orchids and their population, but it's having a go at, have we been effective in controlling access to allow that population to flourish or allow those birds to use the beach? And there are decisions being made about where to access the beach and where, where not to. And it might be against some of the project ideas you have as a community, um, but it's to protect some of those species and the values of the site. That project is really around monitoring that action. A bit more intensity of monitoring of bird population, the threats to it, and have the decisions we've made influence that. So in this project, it's about beach nesting birds and shorebird, migratory shorebirds. What we find on the Discovery Bay June is a steepening of the June. I'm not sure if anyone else has observed this over the years, but we've got a, um, a steepening beach, beach profile in that when the wave and so the feeding zone of these beach nesting birds is getting shorter and the feeding time is getting shorter as well it's getting steeper and then the feeding time is getting shorter because it's getting steeper so the wave comes up washes up and retreats back quicker than it used to in those parts of the discovery bay where these birds are utilizing so the the project around monitoring management assumptions is well are we managing the vegetation on the June face and on that, and, the, and are we managing the beachfront appropriately to allow that June to move and to migrate so that it stays at a nice gentle angle or what's natural for that beach? What we have now is a lot of uh, um, marram grass and exotic species growing in the June. There's a Cape, da Cape Daisy, uh, a particular weed that's in that first primary June that's helping to stabilise the June. Great thing, June stabilisation. <laughs> Uh, Beard Heath is uh, poking its way through as well and, and it's great for dune stabilisation but is it great for beach nesting birds and uh, migratory shorebird habitat? That's what that's about.
So a range of activities in the works and investigation space. Estuary management is continuing with Jared, as I mentioned, still doing environmental water releases. CMA is the environmental water holder. Um, we write a seasonal watering plan to the Minister for Water. They say yes or no, give us an allocation out of Rocklands Reservoir, and then we deliver according to that seasonal watering proposal. And that's really to mimic seasonal, fresh, seasonal flows or summer freshes in the river system. Importantly, not enough water can pump out of Rocklands to open the mouth or anything like that. That doesn't happen. There's probably not enough water to influence the estuary water levels even. What it does do is sends a signal to the fish that are found in the estuaries and says, OK, there's a fresh coming down. Might be time to go think about going upstream. And so it encourages them to go for that joint upstream to complete part of their life cycle. OK? Important for recreational fish, important for um, some of the smaller bodied fish as well. Two years, we're in our th final third year now of a weed, weed control program, woody weed control program. Been looking at a um, bit of polygala in, in uh, some targeted locations. There's been a bit of coast wattle work and Italian buckthorn sort of work, uh, sweet potosporum. And that's around some of the um, uh, threatened um, flora values that are found in Discovery Bay and Lower Glenelg and protecting any vegetation or woody weed encroachment on those locations. Uh, we had a brief stint, 12 months or less than that, of um, a fox control program where we had purely baiting on the beach. Every kilometre we had bait stations set up on the beach for a six week program and that was taking about 50% um, of the baits. So foxes were taking 50% of the baits through that, through that entire six week program, which is pretty high as far as a, a, a bait take. So, um, how effective we are at controlling the fox population, we don't have a clue. We, we couldn't tell you that, but we know that the foxes will keep taking. We could go for 10 weeks and they start to drop off. We could go for 50 weeks and they, start, and they don't start to drop off. So we don't know. So it's really hard for us to justify what we do next in that space. So we're working on it. Just kicked off in the last month or so is a hydrogeology study. We're all very aware there's a strong connection of hydrology and groundwater particularly to how the wetlands function and how the estuary functions in terms of water balance and water levels. That is, um, whilst we know a lot about it, it's still a bit of a knowledge gap in terms of exactly how it's working. So this study is trying to get some agreement across the authorities um, and the expert hydrogeologists, which are talking about fuzzy stuff, you know, <laughs> like where water moves when it gets into the ground, like how do you, how do you work that out? But they, they know. So it's working with them to design, um, to design some um, what we call conceptual models, so it's pictures and textual descriptions and, um, and graphs to describe what's going on. Um, the classic case is Long Swamp is primarily a rain, rainfall fed uh, but groundwater dependent ecosystem. So it depends on groundwater being there but rainfall coming in and topping the levels up. And you can look at um, the weather in terms of the climate, the rainfall we get and the water level in Long Swamp, and there's probably a two or three day lag between a rainfall event and Long Swamp level rising, and that's pretty consistent throughout. Okay, so um, it's important space for us to keep watching. Simpsons Landing Upgrade, that's a great little project um, just up, up the road here, and thanks to some Ramsar funding, we, we've actually got Simpsons Landing an upgrade, so a fixed timber structure, timber jetty structure, was perfectly fine and, and serviceable, got really slippery and muddy when the water got over it. And it wouldn't move. The estuary level kept rising and the bloody timber structure wouldn't move. So we changed one of them to a floating structure. So it moves up and down. The estuary can do what it wants, but the, um, and there you can still launch your boats and, and use that facility all the time. So that's a, a great little outcome. I'd just like to add that um, this, is, this is all pretty important for, for my, my role, is that it's public funds we're spending here. It's your taxpayer dollars. Um, it's your water charges, so you get charged rates on your water, that gets collected by Treasury and we get a tip into that every few years. And so that's where this money has come from, from the state, state collection. Okay? Um, and, but I can't spend money in a Ramsar site which is about ecological values unless I can relate a project back to those ecological values. Okay? And there's a strong linkage. So Simpsons Landing is a, you know, it's a boating structure. How does that relate to ecological values you might ask? Well, it's about letting the estuary do its natural thing. It's about letting the estuary um, come up and down as its natural cycle if, and not us not intervening to open the estuary because infrastructure is flooded or 
some private land might be flooded. Um, so if we can take that out of the equation, we can let the estuary do its thing. A higher estuary water level also means better habitat for small bodied fish and um, recruitment of those larger bodied recreational fish at the right times of year. It also means inundation of wetland margins. If you know anything about wetland um, ecology, that's where the weeds are. <laughs> they're not in the open water, they're not in the healthy functioning part of the wetland, they're in the edges that get a bit of attack from the, the surrounding land use, pasture grasses and that sort of thing, and they're, and they're in that margin. So that's what we're trying to influence there. Same um, conversation is about Beach Road. So the project is to lay, raise the level of Beach Road uh, right down towards the car park end where it gets um, near the salt marsh. And that's where we're getting a lot of, a lot of inquiry at when it floods to open the estuary mouth again. So if we can take the infrastructure out of the equation, we're you know, protecting that ecological habitat and letting the estuary do its natural thing. This section here is Beach Road project where we've got um, the blue line is pretty much water level or the, the land level. And then this red line is, is where um, sort of a design, uh, design height of where, the road, where we want infrastructure to stay away from, um, to stay above, above that height, if you like. And that's around 2.2 metres AHD, Australian height datum. Uh, that's for the estuary as well as any, any sort of fringing areas. So um, that's not a flood zone necessarily. That's, um, that's estuary impacts, storm surge impact sort of areas that we're, as, as a CMA, that's an advice line. And so down here, Beach Road um, sits down at below that line. And so that's infrastructure that's in that zone where it's getting in the way of estuary water dynamics, estuary water level dynamics, and also, which is what you can see here. So the water level there is probably at about 1.9, almost two metres. And so we get calls to open the estuary mouth in these conditions and that's not good for the ecological outcomes we're seeking. So the Beach Road project is really to raise the level of that road. Tiller investigations, uh, Long Swamp, as you know, the good folk at Nature Glenelg Trust have done a lot of work in um, Long Swamp and the field nets over the years um, in monitoring at Long Swamp, fish, frogs, the orchid species that are found there and, and birds. What we hadn't done so much of is those little other wetlands, Lake Monobiong, Swan Lake, Lake Malsey, Bridgewater Lakes, those systems, and Cane Flat Swamp, doesn't get looked at very much. So that's uh, a study we're just, just completing at the moment, just got a draft report in, looking at the values in those. So now we've got a great bathymetry, we've got all this submerged underwater camera footage, if you're interested, um, to see what sort of things are growing there and we've got some good fish data in terms of what fish populations are found there. The Wetland Monitoring Project uh, 2008, Australia Arthur Ryler Inst Institute, a gentleman by the name of Steve Sinclair, mapped the wetlands and all the vegetation, classified it, scored it in terms of how healthy or weedy it was, um, and he's just redone that last year. So 10 years later, so 2018. Now that has given us a before and after comparison. We used the 2008 stuff for listing, to listing the site, what has it got? And now we've said, well, this is what it's like now at the start, really. So that's great, great little data set. And what we've seen is an increase in some of those vegetation areas, a, a decrease in a couple of areas, because the Long Swamp trial, you would know, has, has actually impacted some of the vegetation around, some of the terrestrial vegetation that was invading and create a little open water uh, patch in the middle, whereas that was sort of drying up and disappearing. So whilst we've got a great wetland restoration outcome, we've lost some of the species around the edge, which is by and large believed to be a good thing. Still trying to look at Eel Creek, replacing the culvert at Eel Creek, which has failed in the middle and looking to be a bit of a barrier. Uh, the good folk also at Nature Glenelg Trust have um, worked with Parks Victoria and Good Engineering to um, make that temporary sandbag structure and actually make that sandbag structure sort of bury it in sand, um, geotextile, a fabric, and then um, planting it with native vegetation. So now it's really no asset there, it's just a wetland with a dune. Um, it looks pretty linear, but it'll, it'll soften as the sand blows. I say action plan for one year. We started doing these, or those things are every year. We started doing these things um, beginning towards middle of last year. Last year, year before, and we're still doing them. So, 
we've got till the end of June 2020 to finish those things and then we'll, we'll set ourselves up with a new action plan, which may be finish completing a couple of them or maybe some new actions that we're proposing at the moment and some of your own, own ideas. This is a pretty busy, busy um, picture. I don't expect you to take it all in. But I talk about values of the Ramsar, of the Discovery Bay Ramsar site. These are the values and the description of those is all described in the ecological character description. Okay, so if anyone sitting in Canberra or wherever they are across the world want to look, what's the values of this site? These things are described in pretty, de pretty good detail in this document, 100 page document of, of Ramsar site values. Ecological character description. So if things change from that, we need to demonstrate why or we need to figure out why and we need to fix it. And that's what our management stra strategies are aimed at, making sure those things don't change too much or those things are achieved. Down here, we've got some resource condition targets, um, which are really, uh, I don't know, um, things that we have to do. Maintaining the seasonal stratification of the Glenelg estuary, um, maintaining water bird diversities, you know, greater than 32 species of birds in water birds across a number of different guilds. And we've got a range of um, management activities here. And they are the, that's, these are all published in the management plan, our know, Ramsar management plan. So we've converted those two, those two big documents into a horrendous graph like this, just to put out on the table at our committee meetings and work through how are we working on this, how are we working on that. There's a bit of logic of why we're doing this and how it relates. And uh, if, if we ever have a conversation, I need to tie back an action from a project we're proposing to get funding, I need to tie it back to one of these values. Just a final, final note, what I'm hearing from the you know, the ecologists that are you know, experts on these matters of species that are coming out, they're not, um, they're not telling me it's all doom and gloom for, for these species. Like it's, it's a really good, good picture in terms of the, the number of um, birds that are coming out and the, the orchid species they're finding. Um, and that each season they're coming out, they're seeing a bit of an adaptation almost, a new, a new thing or they're seeing a bit of the habitat that the particular species likes wasn't over in this wetland last year, but it's popped up over there this year. So the habitat diversity or the wetland diversity is changing as we, as we go on. So, and species are adapting to that. They're moving around as, as you would. Thank you, everyone. I hope I've touched enough and haven't bored you too much. <laughs>